I'm Mike. I work for Tenten. Tenten is a startup company in New York, and we sponsor the development of MongoDB. Uh, so for those of you who aren't familiar with MongoDB, what MongoDB is is an open source, high performance, schema free, document oriented database. And what's really great about that is that I get to get all of my buzzwords out of the way on the first slide. Um, but hopefully by the end of the talk, I'll, I'll have given you guys an idea of why these traits combine to make something that, uh, that should be interesting to you guys. So can the guys in the back here, okay? Okay, good. Um, so what I do at Tengen is I work primarily on the Ruby and Python client libraries for MongoDB, so that's a little background about myself. Um, and the plan for this talk is really gonna be to introduce MongoDB sort of by way of comparing it to some, some other things in the uh, data storage space that you might be familiar with already. Uh, and then we'll sort of get right into code examples, sort of how does MongoDB work, how does the API look from Ruby, how do you interact with it, what types of queries can you perform. Uh, and if there's time, we'll get a little bit into the auto sharding uh, and how that works, because people tend to have a lot of questions about that and be interested in that. Uh, one note before we go on is that if you guys have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to throw your hand in the air and, and I'll try to get to those rather than just drive right through to the end. So to sort of introduce what the goal is with MongoDB, we like to show this chart. So you can see on the x-axis here we have depth of functionality and on the y-axis we have scalability and performance. So all the way in the upper left hand corner we have things like memcached, which are incredible, incredibly fast and incredibly scalable but they might not have the functionality that you'd expect from a general purpose data store. So with memcached, for example, you basically have put and get on a single key and data can get evicted without you knowing it. So uh, in terms of a general purpose data store, the, we might expect some more functionality. Uh, so key value stores are uh, another sort of hot area right now and those tend to provide a little bit more functionality than something like memcached. So there, a lot of times you can expect persistence. Um, and also some of them have some more interesting query capabilities than just put and get on a single key. So with some of those, you can do things like range queries and that sort of stuff. Uh, all the way in the bottom right hand corner, we have the RDBMS. So the RDBMS supports you know, everything but the kitchen sink. Tons of functionality, um, but they're not that scalable. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And uh, in, for some cases, they're not as performant as some of these other things. So with MongoDB, really what we're trying to do is sort of take the scalability and performance of a key value store and then just sort of push out to the right as far as we can here. So basically any functionality that we can add without degrading performance below uh, or, or too far below what you get from a key value store, we're going to add. So we're really trying to sort of bridge the gap between the traditional relational database and what you get with a key value store. So I think as we go through some of the query examples, you'll see how the APIs and the, the types of queries you can perform aren't that different from what you're able to do with a relational database. So again, as, by way of introduction, um, we don't, so th I think there's a talk tomorrow titled uh, Death to SQL or something along those lines. Uh, and that's not something that we're advocating. So I think that the relational database has been around for uh, the paper that introduced the relational data model was written 40 years ago in April or something. So this is, this is well-studied technology and it's great for a lot of different applications. So we're not advocating that this be thrown out and not used for anything. Uh, we just think that there are some cases where you can get gains by, by moving away from the relational model. So I think that what we'll see over the next couple of years is more of, less of a one-size-fits-all approach to storing data and more of uh, evaluating your problems and picking a data store that matches you know, an individual solution to those problems. So some of the shortcomings that you see with the relational database are in scalability. So with the relational database, it's really easy to scale out vertically. So you can throw more power at a single node and scale that way. Uh, but that quickly gets expensive. Um, and so one thing that a lot of these solutions are trying to do is allow you to scale out horizontally easily. So with a, related, with a relational database to do that, you sort of have to develop your own sharding scheme. Uh, things like distributed joins are really tricky to do properly. So that's one reason why we don't see uh, these massively scalable relational databases. Also, complex transactions across nodes is another really difficult problem. So with a lot of these non-relational systems, you're giving up some of those abilities to do things like joins and complex transactions. And the reason is that so you can gain some scalability. Uh, and there's also some gains, I think, 
in terms of flexibility for developers. So again, I'll, I'll, get in a, I'll, I'll get to in a couple slides how something like MongoDB could give you a little bit more flexibility than you're used to uh, when working with a relational database. So to continue introducing what MongoDB is, I'm gonna sort of talk about some of the features that sort of define it and, and in some sort of separate it from some of the other things out there. So the first really important thing that's sort of essential to understanding MongoDB are these JSON style documents. So basically everything you store in MongoDB is a JSON style document and that's also the way the query API works. So they're really essential to, to using it. And I say JSON style because we don't actually use JSON. So the stuff that we're writing to disk is actually a binary serialized version of JSON that we call BSON. Um, and that has, that's extended slightly to add things like date time support and regular expressions and some other things that are important if you're writing a database which aren't supported in JSON. So that's called BSON and that's actually a useful thing to look at even if you're not uh, enthusiastic about the whole MongoDB thing, the BSON encoding and decoding uh, would be applicable to a wide range of projects and uh, it's sort of an open format and we've implemented it in a bunch of different languages for all the different drivers so that's definitely worth a look independently. Um, so yeah, another cool thing about the, using these JSON style documents is that we can have uh, nested documents as well. So you can have sort of arbitrary hierarchies of documents. So by doing that, the, it's possible that you can eliminate some places where you would normally need to do a join just by embedding documents directly into a parent document. And I'll show an example of that uh, later on. But that's one of the ways where you can really see some uh, extreme performance improvements over using a relational system and doing a join across tables by embedding documents directly uh, inside of a parent document. MongoDB is schema free, so there's no defining a table and saying this column's an integer and this column's a varchar or whatever. Um, basically, you can insert any document of any type or any shape into uh, a collection. So this is more of what I was talking about when I said that there's some gains to be made in terms of flexibility versus a relational database. Uh, and we found that this schema-free approach is a really nice sort of mental match to dynamically typed languages like Ruby. Um, programmers who are used to developing in Ruby are sort of already used to this schema-free mindset. So making this leap is not, uh, not nearly as, as much of a mental jump as for somebody coming from Java or something like that. And one really nice thing about this is not only does it make for sort of quick development cycles, because you can, in your code as you develop and you change your schema on the fly without having to worry about uh, you know, doing a migration or rebuilding a table or whatever. Um, it also makes for doing migrations on a production system, maybe like 90% of migrations in some systems that we've run uh, for a couple years now have turned out to just be, you know, sort of small changes adding a new field to, uh, to a table, table or, or whatever. And by doing schema-free approach, you can basically do that on the fly. So no migration and it's, it's totally trivial. You sort of handle the case in your application logic. And I'll show another example of that later on too, but that's really nice. Um, dynamic queries. So those of you who are coming from an RDBMS background are probably sort of used to dynamic queries with SQL. So this might not seem like too big of a deal, but some of these other systems use various other approaches of querying. So with MongoDB, it's a little bit more traditional. So we have traditional dy dynamic queries with, you know, you can s manually specify indexes and we have a query optimizer. Um, and this turns out to be really nice. So in terms of just administration, being able to run queries on the fly, inspect the data in your database, and also it's sort of familiar to all of us. So this is the way we do development now and it's not this huge uh, jump. So this is sort of one thing that separates MongoDB from CouchDB, because that's a question that a lot of people end up asking. So with CouchDB, you define these, it's actually a really cool mechanism. You define these uh, basically custom map reduce functions that are basically custom index building, and uh, then you do queries on that. So it's, it's sort of static and predefined what your queries are in order to generate these custom indexes as you insert data. Um, and with MongoDB, again, it, it's totally dynamic. It's, it's a little bit more like what you're used to with SQL or whatever. And if you define your indexes appropriately, um, it's basically equivalent what's going on in the back end. So one thing about MongoDB is that we've really focused on performance uh, from the very beginning. So there's a lot of decisions that have been made, which you'll see as you sort of go through docs or whatever, um, that have been made 
specifically for performance reasons. So single node performance is definitely a target of, of MongoDB. So um, things like we don't use a, a REST uh, protocol for talking to the database by default. We have a binary socket protocol that speaks ESON, which is this binary JSON format that I talked about earlier. Um, so there's a bunch of decisions that have been made for that. And what's sort of cool about it is that if you have really great single node performance, it, it sort of opens up opportunities to use a database in places where we might normally consider a database to be too heavyweight. So things like logging, writing logging directly to the database or session management or all sorts of stuff like that where normally you might not think that a database is applicable here, uh, you could consider writing directly to the database. So replication, MongoDB supports replication out of the box. Um, master slave replication, any number of slaves. You can have a slave be a master to other nodes, so sort of daisy chaining. We also support this mode called replica pairs, which is a little bit cool. Basically, you can set, right now the limit is two nodes, but we're planning on extending that in the future. But basically, you can set two nodes such that uh, they're master and slave to each other. So at any one time, one of them is master, and the driver's talking to that. And if the master fails, the slave automatically promotes itself, and the driver knows how to talk to that. So basically, you get automatic failover. Um, and so that's really cool. Auto sharding is sort of our path to infinite scalability. And hopefully, we'll have time, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more in depth about how that works in MongoDB later on, because that's something people tend to be pretty curious about. So the last sort of defining feature is that it's well supported across various different platforms and languages. So you can run the server on OSX, Linux, Windows, uh, FreeBSD, Solaris, all of these 32 or 64 bit. Um, and there are drivers written for Ruby, obviously, Python, C, C++, Java, Erlang, PHP, Perl, you name it. So, um, so it's, you can use it from a lot of different places. So to sort of summarize what we've talked about so far, um, what are some things that I think MongoDB is good at? I, I think it's good at the web. So this was actually originally developed as sort of part of a full stack cloud computing platform. Um, and we sort of ripped the database out and, and made it its own standalone product. So basically, it was developed to be the, the backing data store for web applications. And again, this is something that sort of shows throughout a lot of the decisions that have been made. So uh, that's something that it's very good at. It's good at caching. So a lot of people have found that you don't, there isn't a need for putting something like memcache in front of uh, MongoDB. So it uses memory map files, and it tends to be really performant uh, in that regard. But also, you can use it as a caching layer in front of you know, some other process that's generating data. So you can sort of have your caching layer be able to do some of these complex queries that I'll talk about in a bit. And there are people using it for that sort of thing as well. Uh, so it's good for high volume data, things like logging, things like analytics, um, that sort of stuff it tends to be really good at because of the way that inserts and updates work. And it's good for scalability. And, and that comes back to that sharding thing, which I'll talk about at the end. Uh, things that MongoDB is less good at. So if you have a highly transactional system where you really need complex, multi-row transactions, MongoDB is probably not an option. So Basically, there are no transactions in MongoDB. There's no rollbacks. And there's atomicity, but only on a single document at a time. So doing sort of these multi-document transactions is, is really not possible. Um, we haven't found that there's been, there's been too much of a need for that with most of the people that are using this now. But uh, if that is something that you have a need for, this probably isn't a good solution. Ad hoc BI, um, you could certainly use this for BI. but it's not a target of the system. So like I said, we've really focused on sort of what, as, a, as a web backend, and we haven't, you know, there are specialized solutions for BI, so if that's what you, if that's what you want to use, then I would probably recommend looking at one of those. And finally, if your problem requires SQL, so if you're using some tool that's generating SQL queries or something like that, uh, MongoDB isn't an option. So now we'll talk a little bit about some basics of working. Uh, this is going to be more at sort of the API level. So the first thing, I already mentioned this, uh, the unit of storage is a document. It's stored in this BSON format, which is, stands for binary JSON. And from Ruby, basically, you can just think of it as a hash. So the Ruby driver takes hashes and encodes them to BSON, and then takes BSON and decodes them back to regular hashes. So that's really all you have to think about. Uh, and a collection. So a collection is sort of like the schema-free equivalent of a table. So 
a single database in MongoDB can have any number of collections. And basically, they're logical groupings of documents. So since it's schema-free, you might be thinking, well, I have no need for different tables then because I can put, no matter what my documents look like, I can put them all in the same collection and that'll be fine. And, and that's true, you could sort of do things that way, but um, by grouping things logically, it, it gives you better performance on disk, but also things like indexes are defined per collection. So even though it's totally schema-free, you're generally gonna have an idea of, say, a user's collection. And all of your users might not be identical, but you have some sort of underlying schema there. So that's sort of where collections come in. And this is sort of a little bit of a side note, but I think that in my example code, this underscore ID thing pops up, so I just wanted to explain it beforehand. So underscore, underscore ID is this special key that's present in all documents in MongoDB. Um, it's unique across collections. You can either use your own underscore ID, so if you have some unique key, you can use it as underscore ID, or the driver will insert one for you. So to sort of go over how queries look and how the API looks, uh, we're gonna do a simple sort of blog backend. So I'm just gonna show you how you could represent posts and how you might do some queries that you would use to, to implement a blog. So here's a simple post. Um, you can see it's just a hash, and we can take advantage of some you know, Ruby data types like a time instance, and that will automatically be converted to a BSON date. Um, we can put arrays there. We can embed documents even, which we don't do in this example. Um, and here's a comment. So the comment is, again, very similar. Just an author, date, and text. So to create a new post, Basically what we do is we take this post hash and we just save it in the post collection. So this DB post thing is the post collection and this, when we save this, it's gonna automatically insert it and add that underscore ID thing that I talked about earlier. So this is a little bit more of a complex example. So here what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our comment and we're gonna embed it directly into that post document. So this is what I talked about right at the beginning. Now we can avoid doing any joins by getting our post and getting all the comments with it. Um, so in a relational database, you'd probably have a separate comments table and a separate post table in this example. And so one way to do this would be we could go get our post from the database, we could insert the comment into our comments array, and then we could save the post back. And that would work fine, but one cool thing about MongoDB is that there's a bunch of these sort of atomic update operators. So here what we're gonna do, instead of doing that sort of two round trips, we're gonna just send an update message. And we're gonna update the document where underscore ID is the underscore ID of that post we just inserted. So that first hash is sort of selecting which documents we wanna update. And then the second hash tells us what the update's gonna look like. So the update's gonna be a push of this comment C into the comments array and that'll automatically append the comment to the array or insert or create a new array if it, if it doesn't already exist. Is post the collection identifier? Uh, the question is, is post the collection identifier? Yes, so this, this post thing is the name of the collection. So then we can do some queries on that. Uh, so here we're gonna find all the posts where the author is Mike. So basically the way the queries work in Mongo is that you give it a hash that shows you sort of what you want your resulting documents to look like. So this is uh, pretty similar to how queries work in SQL, say. So here we're just gonna do a find where author is Mike. We can also do some more advanced queries. So here we're gonna do a, a sort, uh, order by date descending, and limit it to 10 results. So this is an easy way to get the last 10 posts. Um, and since you can have indexes and stuff, you can make queries like this efficient, range queries like this efficient. So here is um, another example of sort of a more complex query. So just like we had this dollar sign push operator for doing updates, we also have some dollar sign operators for doing queries. So here we're gonna do a, a query to find where posts where the date is greater than this date that I constructed for last week. Um, so we use this dollar sign GT operator to say greater than. There's a couple other operators too, which I'll show a, a partial list of in a bit, but uh, if you wanna know what all the possible operators are, you should probably just hit the docs on that. Um, we can also do regular expression queries. So if we just say 
where text and we and we give text as a regular expression, uh, that will also automatically get encoded to BSON and sent across, and the database knows how to understand it. So here we're going to find the post to end in Ruby. Uh, if we were doing a prefix regular expression, it would actually use an index too. So uh, so that's sort of cool. I, I mean, it's not general purpose, but for some types of regular expressions, we can use an index. Uh, so here we're going to find tag, a post with a specific tag. And if you remember that tags field was an array, um, so here it was MongoDB and Ruby. And if we just search for where tags is MongoDB, that's going to reach inside that array and look at every element in the array and find the posts that have, that contain MongoDB in that tags array. Um, and sort of a cool feature is that if we create an index on tags, it's actually going to index that document on each element in the array. So we call this multi-keys. And basically it lets you do, uh, obviously it's perfect for tagging, but you can sort of fake a little bit of full text search stuff by, uh, by doing this uh, multi-keys thing. And that's how some of, some like blogs that are running on MongoDB now, that's how they do their search is, is using this multi-keys feature. So there's count, so you can count all the posts in a collection in the first line. You can also count posts that match uh, a certain query. Uh, here's basic paging, so we have limit and skip. So we're going to limit the results to the page size and skip over n pages of results. Uh, so here's an interesting example. This is uh, what I was talking about, how migrations become trivial. So here if we decide, you know, we've got this blog running for a couple weeks, we've got a ton of posts in it. And we realized, hey, it would be nice if we had like a title for all these posts in here. So we decided to add a title field to our post documents. And basically, it's as trivial as just starting to add new posts <laughs> with a title field. So your old posts, when you get them from the database, won't have that title field. And you handle that case in your application code. And your new, page, your new posts do. And so the nice thing about that is that, let's say you roll out this new version of your application that starts adding titles. And you realize something's broken and you need to roll back. So not only was the migration forward migration trivial, but you can also, if your application code is implemented in a reasonable way, you can also roll back your application code and continue to use these new documents that were inserted and just ignore the title key. And your old code will still work perfectly fine without doing any sort of schema migration or anything like that. So Again, it's not fully general purpose migration proof. If you need to do some you know, complex transformations or, and things like that, uh, you can get yourself in a situation where you need to run some form of migration. But in the general case, we found that you can avoid a lot of that stuff uh, because it's schema free. So this is just a list of some of the more advanced query operators. So we have all sorts of different inequality operators, greater than, less than, greater than or equal to, not equal to. Uh, we also have some that operate on lists. So you can say, uh, I want only an array that contains all of the elements in this array that I'm giving you. Or in and not in are sort of cool too. That's basically a way that you can fake ors. So if you have, uh, if you have two authors and you want to get all the posts by either author, you can pass an array of authors and say in this array. So you could say, give me all the posts where author is in Mike or Elliot, for example. Uh, where? So this is another sort of interesting thing about MongoDB is that uh, it's got sort of tight integration with JavaScript. So there's a JavaScript interpreter embedded in the database, and you can run arbitrary JavaScript expressions as queries. So here we're going to do a where clause, and we give it this JavaScript string, and basically this is going to get evaluated against each document and only return the documents where it's true. So the downside of where is that you can't take advantage of indexes because basically the database has no way of knowing uh, what your random JavaScript function is going to be doing. But it can be very useful if you're able to sort of use some of these normal filters and then sort of tack on a where in addition. So you could use post where author is Mike, and that will take advantage of an index on author. And then you can use a where clause in addition to sort of filter that down at a more fine-grained level. And so that's very cool. And there's also um, JavaScript appears in several other places. So we have this eval thing where you can basically run 
arbitrary JavaScript that's not even a query on the database. And we also have a JavaScript shell, which I'll talk a little bit about later, but that's very cool for doing sort of administrative stuff and just playing around with the database on your machine. So in the Ruby world, there's some more interesting things to look at, which is a variety of sort of higher level projects that have been implemented on top of this driver that I've, I've been talking about uh, to give you things like validations and models and that sort of stuff that you might be used to. Um, so three of the projects that might be worth a look are Mongo Mapper, uh, Mongoid, and Mongo Record. So this is an example of Mongo Mapper, and you can see that you know you have things like validations and uh, associations and models and that sort of stuff. So um, I would actually recommend that if you guys are playing with this for your own applications, start out using the Ruby driver uh, directly. A lot of people have found that you know once you get used to that API, it might might not, might not be totally familiar to you coming from Active Record or you know Data Mapper or whatever else. But once you get used to that API, it can be pretty nice and lightweight. And if you decide that you need validations and you need this stuff that these are providing, then you'll only be a leg ahead because you'll know what they're doing underneath. And you'll be able to sort of jump down to that lower level if you need to. So that's, uh, that's my recommendation. But these are cool projects too. So um, Other cool stuff to look at if you're playing with MongoDB are aggregation. So there's sort of some built-in aggregation, basically sort of like a group by. Uh, and also MapReduce. So in the most sort of most recent development versions, we have MapReduce support. Uh, this is different from the MapReduce that you might expect or that you hear about with CouchDB. So with CouchDB, again, MapReduce is sort of treated as custom index building. Here it's more like a little bit more traditional MapReduce, and it's basically used for things like aggregation. So uh, the nice thing about MapReduce is that it also works in sharded setups. So uh, you can do some complex aggregation that way. Uh, cap collections. So cap collections are a really cool feature. Basically, you can create a new collection and say, I want to limit it to 50 gigs or to 50,000 documents. And what will happen is that as you insert data, once you hit that limit, it'll just wrap around and start overwriting the first data that you inserted. So this is really cool for implementing things like logs that have, you know, sort of auto rollover. Uh, and we use it actually internally for replication. We store operations in an op log that's a cap collection. Um, but that's a cool feature for a lot of use cases. Unique indexes. So the index on underscore ID that I told you about is unique, but you can also create general unique indexes if, uh, if you know that this is a constraint that you want um, to apply when you're creating an index. If you try to insert a duplicate key, it'll basically, the insertion will fail. The Mongo shell, like I talked about, there's this JavaScript shell that comes with the, di the distribution. And it's really nice for being able to sort of programmatically interact with the database. And it's real quick to start up, uh, go through the tutorial using that. But also later on to do administrative stuff. So like I said, I, I do a lot of work on driver development. And there's a lot of times throughout the day that I fire up the shell to do some quick queries, see what's in the database. And it's, I don't know, it's just a little bit easier than writing a script to do the same thing. Uh, and GridFS. GridFS is another cool thing that's sort of worth a look. Basically what it is is a specification for storing large binary uh, data within MongoDB. So what we do is we sort of, the Bizon thing su supports storing binary data, but documents are limited to a size of about four megabytes total. So with GridFS, basically we chunk up your binary data and store it in individual documents using a, using a spec that we've come up with. And the nice thing about doing it that way is that then there's a whole host of drivers and tools that know how to interact with this data stored in this spec. Um, and you know, cool things about GridFS are that if you store files in GridFS and you've already got replication set up for your database or sharding set up for your database, you can sort of leverage that for your file storage as well. Um, so that's worth a look as well. So if people don't have questions now, uh, we've got a couple minutes left. So I can dive in a little bit on sharding and tell you a little bit about how that works. So sharding is sort of our path to infinite scalability. And basically, 
what it does is split up your data across several different nodes. So replication we treat as a path to failover. So there you're replicating the same exact data across nodes. Whereas sharding, you're storing different data on different nodes in order to scale out. Um, and so before we get too deep into it, I'll introduce some terminology that we use. And it's a little bit, it can be a little bit confusing when you read a bunch of papers about this stuff because people use these terms in a lot of different ways and we're just as guilty of that as everybody else. But this is how I'm using them for the rest of this talk. So uh, a shard key is basically a single key in your document that you're going to split up your documents by. So in the example of the blog post, maybe we'll split up our documents by date. So we would set our shard key as date. And so then all of the documents in that collection are gonna be split up into ranges based on their date. And those ranges are called chunks. So you can think of a chunk basically as just a range of the value space for a single key in a collection. So a chunk could be represented by a tuple that looks like collection name, shard key, minimum value, and maximum value for that chunk. So basically every chunk, your, your entire collection is gonna get split up into these chunks. If it's a small collection, maybe to start with you only have a single chunk. And what auto sharding does is take care of splitting up those chunks of data and distributing them to different shards. So a shard is a single node or several nodes. Uh, here it says replica pair, but uh, the model going forward is that you're gonna be able to have sort of n nodes per, per shard. But basically, every node in a shard is gonna be responsible for a set of these chunks of data. So given some, given some value, it's gonna live in a single chunk, some value for a key in your collection, it's gonna live in a single chunk, and that chunk is gonna live in a single shard, which could be multiple machines, and probably should be multiple machines for failover's sake. So to sort of, um, diagram this out because that doesn't help too much. This is the way it looks in terms of like a process diagram. So we have a single client and it's talking to this process called Mongo S. The S stands for shard. Um, and Mongo S is basically a lightweight database router. It's pretty stateless and it basically gives you the same API that you're used to working with when you're talking to a single node or to a replica pair or whatever. So the client code doesn't have to really change at all to use sharding. And what Mongo S does is it handles, when it gets a query, it knows which shards might contain that query and it handles routing out your query to all the different shards that might have results for you. And basically, it's sort of like a merge sort engine as well. So, you know, if you're doing a range query, Mongo S can send out the query and then merge back in the results. And so this is where it becomes important what your choice of shard key is. So if you choose your shard key as the date, and then you do a query on date, that's gonna be really fast because Mongo S knows where that chunk lives, and it can route your query to a single shard, get the result, and give it back to you. If you choose your, your shard key as date and you do a query on author without including date at all, Mongo S has no idea where the documents with matching authors might be. So it's gonna have to route that query to every single shard and merge back in the results. And you can imagine there's all sorts of different combinations of how many, uh, depending on your query, how many shards might have to be involved. So the key when you're, when you're setting up sharding is choosing a shard key that's appropriate to the types of queries that you're doing, uh, such that MongoS doesn't have to distribute your query across you know, tons of nodes just to return, just to return the result. And for you know, smaller setups, four or five shards, it might be fine to do a couple of these distributed queries. Um, but for larger setups, thousands of nodes, obviously that's gonna be a huge performance bottleneck. Yeah? Uh, let's say two or three sets of um, replicas that has different shard keys and MongoS can decide which shard key to use or? Okay, so the question was could you have different replicas that are sharded on different keys and let Mongo S decide which shard key to use. So, um, so that's a good point. So basically you can think of the sharding as like a distributed index. Just like you have indexes on each of these individual nodes, you have sort of this distributed index and Mongo S knows where that data might live. Um, the answer is that I don't think we're planning to do anything uh, like that Currently, I mean, there's no reason you couldn't do it yourself in your application code. You could have multiple collections 
each of which is sharded on a different key and insert into both of those collections manually, which is pretty much what this would have to do, uh, at least the way the setup works right now. So yeah, so again, MongoS can talk to any of these different shards, each of which could be multiple nodes so that you have failover on that level. Um, but the cool thing is that, like I said, MongoS is pretty much completely stateless. So it's not like this single point of failure down here. You can have multiple MongoS's as well. So you can talk to any of these MongoS's and any of them know how to, how to route your results or how to route your queries appropriately. So there's really no, um, no problem if one of those MongoS's fails. You can just go talk to another one. And another cool thing about that is that there's lots of ways you could actually set this up in terms of physical hardware. So one thing that, one setup that we think is interesting uh, and that we definitely want to experiment with is having a MongoS per app server, basically. So if MongoS lives on the same machine as your application code, then all of that communication is going over localhost, and it's only these remote hops that are actually going out on the wider network. So the question now is, if all these MongoSs are completely stateless, where is sort of this configuration information stored? And that's where these config servers come in. So these are basically like a, a special separate set of MongoD instances that store configuration information. And that information is basically a mapping from those chunks that I talked about to shards that own those chunks. So you can think of the data in these config servers as just a list of chunks with a shard identifier saying which shard has them. And the thing about these is that every, all, all of the basically metadata changes that go on here are done using two-phase commit. So this is actually like synchronous replication just for this config server part, whereas a lot of the rest of the stuff that goes on in MongoDB is all asynchronous replication. Um, and so sort of to give you an idea of how failover works here. So like I said, any of these MongoSs can fail and you can just talk to another one and that's fine. Um, shards, any single one of those MongoDs can fail in this setup because we have a replica pair and then we can just talk to the other one and that's fine. If all, of the, if all of the nodes representing a shard fail, then we lose access to those chunks that that was responsible for until we bring one of those back up. And config servers are sort of special because we need those to know where things live. Um, and so the way it works is that if a, if a config server is down, we can't do any metadata changes until we get that config server back up. So we can continue to do queries, we can continue to insert data, but we just can't change where a, sh where a chunk lives. So what happens is that a, as a chunk fills up, there are two operations we perform. We perform a split, which basically divides the chunk into two chunks, and we perform a migrate, which can move the chunk to a new shard. And that's how we achieve load balancing, basically. And so if a config server is down, we won't perform either splits or migrates. And that's so that we make sure that we have a consistent view of what lives where across the whole system. And that's not actually too big of a problem because if you imagine you know, a production system that's been up for a while, the, the chunks in these shards are gonna be pretty well balanced already. So going a couple hours without doing any of these sort of rebalancing operations is not, not too big of a deal. Um, and so yeah, so MongoS basically just caches that information that, that lives in the config servers. Okay, so what I would like for all of you guys to do who are in the audience, if you haven't done it already, is download MongoDB. It's really easy to install. It takes like two minutes to download. We have binaries for all these different platforms, so nothing, nothing stopping you there, and try it out. So try it out from the shell. Install the Ruby, Ruby driver. It's on Gem Cutter. Play with that, and let us know what you think. So write a blog post, put something on Twitter, email us, whatever. Um, we really just wanna sort of continue to build a strong community. There's already a pretty strong community, especially in Ruby. Um, but that's sort of the goal, so please do that. And uh, the website's mongodb.org. We're on IRC all the time. Um, we have a Google group. This is what we use for basically most of the interaction uh, in terms of within the developers, but also with users happens on that list. Uh, we're on Twitter. I'm on Twitter if you wanna ping me directly. Uh, that's my personal email if you wanna ping me directly as well. And this slideshow will be up there at some point. It's not up there right now, but next couple of days. Yeah, question. So you mentioned using this for sessions. Is that something that you've uh, actually implemented? Yeah, so um, 
I've used it for sessions in one small app that I've written that isn't really deployed anywhere. But people are using this for sessions, and there are some uh, there are some nice wrappers that people have written around other session libraries that will basically persist the data in MongoDB. I can't remember at the moment if there have been any of those written for Ruby. Uh, it's sort of hard to keep track of all these third-party packages that are going around. But there's that, you know, that's definitely a great use case for it. Yeah? Is there any way to query against embedded documents? Yeah, so the question is, was, is there any way to query against embedded documents? And I, I probably should have had a slide on that. But yeah, there is. So not only can you query against them, but you can also build indexes on embedded documents. So the cool thing about this BSON format is that the database knows basically under, completely understands the format. So the database is sort of able to reach into your documents and get at sub-documents and all that sort of stuff. So you can basically create an index on uh, posts.comments or comments.author in that example. And then we'd have an index on the authors within those comments. And you can do the same thing with queries. You could query on comments.author or comments.date. Yeah? You uh, mentioned the scalability as one of the uh, selling points. Uh, how big? OK, so the, so the question is, how big are uh, the current deployments? So we maintain a list of production deployments that we know about, uh, and that's on the website. If you go to mongodb.org and you do a quick search for production deployments. In terms of, in terms of absolute size, um, so this sharding thing is, is actually under really active development right now. So I don't know of anybody using this on a, like a large site in production right now, the sharding layer. Everything else, the replication, the core server, all the querying, all the index building, that's all very stable. That's been used in production for like two years now. Um, so one of the bigger sites that use it, that's using this right now is SourceForge. Um, I, think they, I think their setup is that they have not too much data on the order of say two terabytes of data. And they've got it in a replicated setup. So they've got a single master and maybe six or seven read-only slaves. So they write, do all writes to the master. It's like most web applications, it's very read heavy. They do all writes to the master and all reads distributed across these slaves. And I think the, the way they're using it is they store basically a document for each project on SourceForge. And so when you hit a project page on SourceForge, it's pulling a document out of MongoDB. Again, no memcache or anything like that. And uh, basically all the information for that project is in those documents. So I think about 90% of SourceForge traffic hits MongoDB now at some point. Yeah, in the back. Um, I was just interested, uh, is uh, replication always like a full replication or do you, can you support parity and, and that sort of thing? So the question was, is replication always pull or do we support parity and that sort of stuff? So right now, replication is basically completely asynchronous, pull only. Um, this is something that we're actually actively thinking about in ter especially in terms of the way sharding works, is possible different setups. But right now, you know, the, the thing that's production ready and really the only thing that's in active development right now is pull only. So it uses basically an adaptive mechanism. So when you do a pull, the master, master keeps a log of operations that it's performed in a cap collection. And the slave, every couple of seconds to start with, does a pull and gets all the operations that have been performed since its last pull and applies those. Um, but then the way it works now is we use sort of an adaptive timing. So if the slave pulls and a ton of operations have been performed, then it'll start pulling a little more frequently. And if the slave pulls and nothing's been performed, it'll stop pulling so frequently. So it's sort of adapted, but yeah, it's totally asynchronous. Yeah? Um, um, does it cache any, any parts of the database in memory, or does it keep it all on disk, or how does that work? Okay, so the question was, does it cache any parts of the database in memory? Does it keep it all on disk? How does it work? Um, the answer is that basically we, we completely leverage your memory map files. So we sort of let the OS handle it. Um, everything, everything in the database lives in memory map files. It indexes all the data. Um, and the OS is responsible for when that gets paged out. So this is why we can maintain the performance of close to things like memcached D. Um, because let's say if, you know, if all of your data is resident in memory, then basically what you're doing is, is memcached D with some nice query mechanisms on top of it. So one thing that we're working on right now, which I think might be in the latest, latest tip, is uh, a, an operation to perform a guaranteed full F-sync. 
uh, and then lock the database. So this is very useful for things like Amazon EBS. You could do a full F-Sync, lock the database, take an EBS snapshot, and then come right back up within the matter of half a second or something like that. So that's something we're working about. Um, on disk durability hasn't been too much of a focus in terms of um, traditional ACID durability. And the reason why is because that uh, we're really treating replication as our path to failover. So the idea is get it on a replica somewhere, and if you get it on enough replicas, it'll get to disk. The question was why not use something like a distributed hash table to store configuration information for the sharding? Um, it's something, again, this is something we're, we're thinking about doing. So the sharding layer is really in active development right now. We're hoping to have a beta out for sharding um, within the, by the end of the year. So again, sort of the production stuff, the really stable stuff is the non-sharded stuff. Um, but things like Zookeeper, other distributed hash table type things are definitely an interesting approach to storing that configuration information. So um, it's something we're thinking about. Right now, we sort of use our own our own stuff for that. So. One question: uh, Is there any plans to have a hotspot be able to tell its peers when being asked to take the shard off? Right. So the question is uh, basically how does how does load balancing work in the sharded setup? And yeah, so. The answer is it has to be, I mean, the only sane way to do it is to do some combination of data size as well as load uh, in terms of queries per second or, you know, IOSAT or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, so that's how it's going to work in terms of rebalancing. So if one, if one uh, shard is getting totally hammered, then that's a huge signal that we need to rebalance some of that data. The exact mechanics of how we decide when and what to rebalance is still a little bit up in the air. The, the model that's implemented now is, is pretty simplistic. So, anything else? Um, I have some MongoDB stickers. So if people want some of those, uh, come grab me. Also, if you have more questions you want to ask me in person, you know, please pull me aside. Thanks.